This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 179 with guest Ella. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, Ask Kickers. Welcome to another episode of the show. I am so grateful that you are here with me today. I have got a great interview for you and funny story, kind of funny, mildly funny, I guess it is. So I was recording the intro for this and I'm like, I guess her name is Ella. So she, this person that's coming on the podcast is a, is a real life friend of mine. And she was one of my first friends that I made here when we moved to North Carolina. And funny thing is that Ella is her initials and that is the name that she uses for herself for her podcast on air with Ella. And it's sort of, I guess she's now kind of like Beyonce or Madonna where she just goes by her first name. (laughs) I call her by her actual first name, which is not Ella. So it's sort of funny for me to say that. And I was doing an Instagram story at her house one time where I said her actual first name and she was like, no, that's not how people know me online. And I'm like, this is so confusing. So confusing. I don't even know. I don't even know. So that's why it feels a little bit awkward to me. And, but yes, you will know her as Ella. Those are her initials, E-L-L-A. And also wanted to tell you that my book is available for pre-order. How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, 14 Habits That Are Holding You Back From Happiness, Official publication date is January 2nd, 2018, which in reality is right around the corner, right? The holidays are upon us. Then it's going to be the new year so incredibly soon, but it's available for pre-order. And the thing with pre-order is this couple of things. There are a shit ton of bonuses that I am giving away for free if you pre-order the book. So this is only for people that pre-order. If you go to yourkickasslife.com forward slash, wait for it, H-T-S-F-L-S. That's the acronym for how to stop feeling like shit. Obviously, the link is in the show notes as well. That's where you can see all the bonuses. That's where you can also find a link to pre-order the book. Also, it will probably ship earlier than January. No, it will. It'll ship earlier than January 2nd if you pre-order. That's the way it works. As soon as it hits the warehouse in Amazon, they start shipping it. So this happened to me last time, you guys. Quick insider information, peek behind the curtain, wink, wink. The last time I wrote a book, it came out in 2013 or something. I always forget. And I'm a really bad judge of time. I don't know if something happened a year ago or 10 years ago. Somewhere around 2013, my first book came out and my publication date was December. I think it was like the middle of December or something like that. And it was my first time writing a book. I was like, okay, so everyone's going to get their book if they pre-ordered it on that day. So mid-November, I'm getting people messaging me on social media saying like, oh my gosh, I got notification that your book is shipping. And it was like the middle of November. I was like, what? I hadn't even seen it yet. I I didn't even have a copy of my book in my hands yet. And my people, y'all, were getting my book before I had even seen it. So that was sort of funny. So now, second time, I know that this will happen. (laughs) And when I asked them, I'm like, why is my book shipping? And people are getting it early. And my pub date isn't until the middle of December. And they were like, yeah, that's how it works. No one told you that? No, nobody told me. So now I know. And if you pre-order, then it will ship a little bit early, which is fun. So you can go over there and to that page I mentioned, read all of the bonuses that you'll get for free when you pre-order. And the thing with pre-orders too, you guys, here's how it works. I mentioned this a few podcast episodes ago. Another insider information, pre-orders matter so much to authors. Couple reasons. Because bookstores and outlets like Costco, Target, like those types of places, they look at pre-orders. So they make their decision if they're going to buy books from the publisher based on pre-order numbers. So if I don't do very well, (laughs) they'll pass. (laughs) I never knew this. I never knew how important pre-orders were to authors until I started writing books. I was like, oh, that's why. That's why they talk about it so much before the book comes out and beg people to buy it pre-order style. So I am begging, I am begging you to pre-order the book. The publisher gave me a number that they would like to see full transparency. I'm under a lot of pressure. (laughs) 
<laughs> I was not laughing about this a few weeks ago. I was not. It's just one of those things that's important. And I never knew the importance of it until I was, until I became an author. So yes, it's important because bookstores look at these numbers. It matters a lot to the publisher. And so it matters to authors. You know, this is how I make a living. So if I have entertained you in any way over the last several years, I've been doing this podcast. If you have gotten any bit of wisdom nuggets, then please, please, please pre-order my book. I would be so incredibly grateful for it. All right, so let's get on with the show. But first, let me tell you a little bit about First Name Ella. Ella is a motivational speaker and the host of the popular On Air with Ella, a show about living better right now. Ella's favorite space is the intersection between wellness and personal development, and she loves helping people explore and accomplish more in both. She's an entrepreneur, a business owner who's founded three successful businesses, a mom, a wife, and a triathlete. You can find her at onairwithella.com. And without further ado, here is Ella. Hello, Ella. Welcome to the show. Hello, my sister. This is the part where we act like we don't know each other. (laughs) <laughs> this is where the part where we act like we're professionals and we haven't been giggling for 12 minutes already before this yes i know well as i was explaining to people i'm feeling a little bit tired this morning so excuse my slurring i'm not drunk i promise <laughs> you are, i don't know you're you, i know you were free basing cold brew before no we- no probably yes that i would do but no you're my first appointment this morning uh, first like real actual person I've, I've spoken to besides you know the very high-pitched talking to my dog that i do but no as i was telling people you and i know each other in real life and you asked me to buy your podcast a couple years ago and then told me that you live near me and then that's when i realized you were just stalking me and wanted to you know I mean, the truth is I didn't live near you till I had you on the show. And then I was like, got to be closer to this chick. So that happened. Is that weird? A little. (laughs) No. Yeah, we're neighbors. No, I was excited, actually, because, I mean, people listening know how it is when you move to a new place and you don't know anyone. And and grown-up friendships are tricky and hard. And then I met you and decided I was going to steal your dog. You cannot have her. I'd I like know. to establish that. Are we recording? Good. Yes, Good. The dog is mine. She's, you guys listening, she's an Australian shepherd who's white with a Zorro mask across her face. True story. It's a marking. It's not. I mean, Ella doesn't like put a mask on her. It's a marking. And but people you... have asked, Andrea, people have asked. They're like, how did you do that to your dog? And you just like, I'm just gobsmacked. I have no words. <laughs> and cleverly named her Zara. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because she's a girl. She's a girl. And she's just one of those dogs that her personality just... My favorite thing about her, honestly, is that she lays in the middle of your kitchen with like her legs sprawled out underneath her. Like she just gives zero fucks about whose way she's in. (laughs) She's like... All kinds of confidence that she's not going to get stepped on. Andrea, you have to put a picture of Zara in your show notes now. Because yeah, we have three kids between us, but we talk about the dog, just to be clear. So picture of the dog forthcoming. She is my superhero. So speaking of things that we love, and I jokingly say that you have jokingly, I should say, that you're the healthiest person I know, (laughs) which you deny. I just think you don't know enough people, obviously. <laughs> I don't know enough healthy people. <laughs> it's a relative measure. Yeah, so my friends, first of all, thanks for letting me share this space with you. But Andrea is under this just laughable illusion that I am some kind of health nut food freak. And so what's so funny is whenever she comes over and she sees the cookie jar, she's like, dear God, did you have guests? Like, <laughs> What is this wizardry? <laughs> well, and I eat all the cookies, and then you have to get new ones because I eat them all. But, well, what's funny, I'll just tell a quick anecdote. All right, so I don't, I don't know, maybe last time we were over at your house for dinner or the time before that, you had said bring, I think or maybe I had offered, I said, do you want me to bring a salad? So we were in a hurry, and I went to the grocery store and did one of those, like, packet salads. You know, the ones that come with, like, the croutons and the nah, stuff in yeah. it. Yeah, like the nuts and almonds and stuff. And so you were, like, on the phone or something, and I'm... I'm like taking the salad out and I thought to myself, she's probably not going to be okay with the salad dressing that comes, <laughs> but this is the best part. So I hold up the salad dressing packet in there and I was like, is this okay? And the look on your face, you were like, no, <laughs> I was like, okay, that's going in the garbage. <laughs> So that's why I joke that you're the healthiest person I know. 
But you're well, right. My- I, I don't know enough people. Yeah, actually, you asked a real question, and I want to answer it because we're going to talk about wellness today, I know, but the kind of wellness that's relatable. Mm -hmm. And this is how I got here. So the reason I started the On Air with Ella podcast was not because I was a fitness guru or an exercise guru or a nutritionist. I didn't go to any program. I'm not certified in anything. I'm a business owner and a businesswoman and, you know, busy. And I just have a passion for feeling amazing and like Mm -hmm. wanting to show up in this life a certain way. You know what I mean? And feel strong and feel sexy. And I don't care how old I am. Those are feelings I always want to channel. And so I started on air with Ella because I I was like, Hey, you guys, like you don't have to be 2% body fat. Right. And you don't have to like have all of this nailed. Let's talk about ways to sort of feel better and feel even better year to year, actually, and make it easy and accessible. And so I sort of went on this journey trying to bring experts to people who were, again, highly relatable and sharing information that you really couldn't get anywhere else. And it's since sort of become, I don't know, a place where wellness and personal development meet, if that Mm -hmm. makes any sense. Yeah. Well, and I know that recently you kind of went on this, I don't want to use the word tirade. I think that's a little bit dramatic, but about because the industry, the wellness industry, more specifically, probably diet and fitness can be not just overwhelming, but I definitely think that for women and men, a lot of men too, but you know, this show is true is enough, women, but that makes us feel like we're not good enough. I mean, I know I had to go on like an unfollow frenzy because I had, I was following all these, these wellness people mm-hmm. and I would scroll through. Like when I followed them, it was for the intention of, of getting tips and feeling better and, and being inspired and motivated. And it did the opposite. Like it made me feel like shit about myself and that I'm not doing enough. So how do you feel about all of that? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, allow me to answer in the form of story because (laughs) I'm going to share my own sort of crash and burn failure with you because I started, first of all, let's just acknowledge that I'm part of the problem. So I start, I mean, if you look at the cover art for my show, I'm like in these little white shorts and my white tank top and I've got like- In your underwear. in, in, in In my underwear, basically, you know, and I'm all like- fitness rah and you you could be misled very easily by the branding of the show that is where I started. I started in this place where I was like, come on, everybody, let's exercise. <laughs> let's eat right. It's so easy. You don't have to feel bad. And it was interesting because, you know, I was like, honestly, sort of uber fit when I started the show. And I'm a triathlete. It's actually how I enjoy to spend some of my spare time. But at the time, I was sort of in like peak fitness. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, I look better than I did 10 years ago. And I want to share all my secrets with the world. And funny thing happened and that that thing called life interjected and I started I had two businesses one of which I've run for about 15 years and the other one is my online business but then I started a third one because you know Andrea when you did that I was like what is she doing two is never enough so yeah let's launch a third startup so I did that third startup and I, you know, it was too much and I crashed in a hard way and I had other stuff going on as you do. And I just crashed and burned in a huge way, which manifested itself in like a 12 pound solid fat gain. Uh And is that (laughs) when you started having all your gut issues too? Oh my gosh. Gut issues, hormonal issues, like the laundry list of everything that, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's ever done a health and wellness podcast about was like the list of things that I had going on. And I was like, well, this is weird. And I actually went off the air for about six weeks because, and this is where this all comes together because it was my identity. My identity crashed and burned with all of that. So not just my gut, but my identity was in the crapper. I was like, wait, If I don't look a certain way, if I'm not healthful, then who am I? What story do I have to tell? And how do I have any right to turn on my microphone and talk to people about sort of living their best life? Mm -hmm. And I'm like scraping my fat ass off the floor Mm -hmm. and trying. And that's how I felt. That was my mental state. And you know what I did, Andrea? I got on the air and I said exactly that. And that changed everything. So I got on the air. I said exactly that. I dragged that garbage into the light. And funny thing, as we do, when we drag our garbage into the light and shine that light all over it, it's not as big. It's not as powerful. And it doesn't feel like it has dominion over us. You know what I mean? 
so I remember that time and I remember I didn't talk to you a whole lot, but you would leave me like these rushed, hurried messages. Like I could tell you were trying to do all the things that you knew that you were supposed to do, like have a social life and keep reaching out to your friends and and still trying to maintain your marriage. And, and you're also a mom. And, <laughs> and I could tell <laughs> Poor thing. It was like you were checking off the boxes. It's like, OK, I contacted this person and that person. And like, ah. I was sort of like, to be honest with you, I was like sort of sitting back, like waiting for the house of cards to fall i know that's not yeah. very nice but <laughs> no but, but it's, so it's experience no that's just experience talking and you're exactly right and and it was so helpful obviously you know at the time you just want to shoot yourself or somebody and and of course obviously as they do they become like the most cathartic experiences ever so so what it did was first of all it made me a thousand times more relatable because i'm like hey anybody want to dig themselves out of this hole with me let's do it together you know and then secondly it really ripped the veil off for me in understanding two things about the fitness and the wellness industry and that is first of all they are selling overwhelm like overwhelm is a big part of the package and what i mean by that is when you don't feel like you have the answers within you and when you don't feel like you could just sort of take care of you if you actually listen to your own body and your own needs you have to buy that from somebody else. You have to get the kit, the magic pill, the the routine, the food plan. The I mean, there's a codependency that's absolutely necessary when you are sold overwhelmed. Does that mm. does that make sense? Yeah, very, very much. And I, I think that it's yes, I think we are bombarded by do it this way. This is the right way. You're doing it wrong. If you are feeling this way, then you are wrong. You know, and, and I think that that can happen in personal development, too, and not just health and fitness. And I tell people all the time, we talk a lot about self-trust over here. And, and part of that is like you were saying, is listening to your body. And, you know, I'm in one of those situations too, where I know you talk about seasons, you know, like the different mm -hmm. parts of your life. And, you know, you went through a hard one and because I sort of fell off the wagon of working out in 2016. And then when my dad died, it just all went to shit. And it was also like getting cold that time of year. And it just totally fell apart. I gained weight. I told you I had to buy bigger underwear. I've told my podcast people that like four times. <laughs> That's already out there. After I blamed my underwear, like <laughs> I thought something I thought I was like, what? I, like my underwear needed to get its shit together. <laughs> really, like I had just gained weight. And my butt wasn't fitting in my underwear anymore. But um, yeah, so that was happening, and I just—it was the very first time that that had happened to me where I just surrendered to it, and I was like, this is where I am right now. I refuse to beat myself up over it. So now, months later, like a year later, I am just now getting to the point where my body is like, I would really love a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're here. You mean you don't want to just live on Halloween candy? So what do you have to say to that? Like the whole process of just like allowing yourself to, I think my question is like, where is the balance, you know, of allowing yourself to just surrender to it and to the season and also not letting yourself off the hook to just get like what I like to call a case of the fuckets. I totally get it. Okay. So this is a huge question and I want to unravel it a little bit. So the first thing I want to say is the very first thing that you identified, which is so important. And that was essentially that you just decided that you were going to refuse to shame yourself. Right. Exactly. Okay. So which is so new huge. because I've spent <laughs> what, four decades? <laughs> I know right, like you're really well. good at it. Yeah, we're, we we have flexed that muscle many many times. We are professionals, and 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 I say all the time that shame is not a strategy. Like if shame were an efficient, effective strategy, we would all be peak fitness right now, mm -hmm. like peak mm -hmm. wellness. Because who hasn't tried that methodology? And shame beating the crap out of yourself. Oh, as it turns out, doesn't work and doesn't motivate you. Even if you're sort of hard driving a type, like I would confess to being, and you can't beat yourself into submission. You sure as hell can't beat your body into submission over time. You can in short spurts, but let me just touch on this very quickly because it's so incredibly important. We have been taught, it's kind of the flip side to the overwhelm coin. If you aren't doing this, if you don't look this way, if you haven't exercised five times this week, you are broken. Mm -hmm. You are fundamentally broken because paleo works for me. High fat keto works for me. Vegetarianism works for me. You must be broken. You're not doing it right. Well, 
that again is another that's what we're being marketed you know either explicitly or implicitly and the end result is the same and that is that there's something fundamentally wrong with us because we can't get our shit together we can't like make it happen or because of the way we still eat or god forbid because of the way that we look and so i just really want to pull out that thread of what you just said which is that you just decided that you were not going to beat yourself with that club like you've done it been there done that how about we set that club down and sort of let nature take its course if it will okay but what you're also asking is okay but where's the balance and i think this is such a brilliant question and it's one that honestly i'm still evolving in because i have had sort of the veil ripped off as i said where i was like oh i've been eating for years for an outcome i have been Uh eating To look a certain way. And exercising for an outcome. And I have been exercising for an outcome. But wait, does that mean that I should sit on the sofa and eat Doritos as an act of rebellion against social norms? Because that doesn't feel right. I love Doritos, though. (laughs) I do. (laughs) I know. You hate them. You had a whole episode about Doritos. Well, I did. It's fascinating. (laughs) Andrea, it's fascinating. Okay. So here's the deal, though. And I love this because this is just truly authentically where I am and where so many people are. And that is like, is there anything wrong with wanting to feel amazing and feel sexy and like enjoy being in our body and putting on the clothes that we feel good at? Like, is that inherently bad? Because they're, you know, We need to reject social norms about what our body image should be. So you've got like the body positivity movement Mm -hmm. and then you've got the, you know, eat more kale and do squats and follow this diet regimen. It's also like not real. We're all in the middle. Like, of course, you have a few people populating the extremes and those people tend to have a louder voice, Andrea, and they tend to be in social media and they tend to have their podcasts and their, you know, blah, blah, blah. But most of us live in the middle. We're like, actually, I want to feel good. Like, I actually don't want to embrace my inner sloth like all the time, but I also don't want to obsess about it and have this restrictive mentality all the days because that's miserable. Like Mm -hmm. I want to eat my chocolate. I want to move my body, but I don't want to feel like I have to follow somebody else's protocol. I'm in the middle of that evolution and I'm trying to create that space. I'm creating it on my show. I'm creating it in my life. I'm creating it in conversations that I have with my friends. You know what I mean? No more obsession. Yeah, I agree with you. And and I think what I've come to know now in my sort of older, wise 42 years is that it's all a process. Like we're all always evolving and in process. Like personally, there was a time in my twenties where I was in and out of an eating disorder and it was not good at all. And I had to probably in my early thirties, look back on that and think like that could have killed me. Like it was, it was bad. Mm -hmm. And unlearning all of that is going to take a minute. Like it's going to, you know, take a decade. I remember the first time that I gained even more than like five pounds. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Like what's happening emotionally to me? Like you were talking earlier about like our identity. And I think even people who lose a lot of weight, you know, that's a whole nother conversation about their identity has been wrapped up as this overweight person. And then they lose all this weight. And and what is that? And I think there's so much emotions tied to it for women that a lot of times doesn't get addressed. And we think that we can solve the emotional problem. I'm using air quotes over here by trying to control what we put in our mouth and the size of our pants. And it's, I know that's a, this is the whole can of worms that we can go off on another tangent about, but in terms of, of just wellness, and I know that we are so overwhelmed with, you know, do this and use essential oils for all of this. And don't you realize that all your cleaners are toxic? And like, and that it's just like, oh my God, just don't go on Pinterest because then you're going to feel like a failure as a mother and a human being. So where the big question of where can we start? Okay, that's so that's so important because you touch on that like if you listen to everybody, you're just going to go insane, right? So the answer always when we end up in that place is that we have to start with us. And it's like, damn it, because I wanted the pill. Like, I, just, <laughs> I just wanted the thing to buy that solved all of these problems, you know, for me and made this easy. And, you know, why, God, why do I have to start with myself? And at the end of the day, it is absolutely 100% a self-awareness game. But, 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 but 
can we learn from others? Are there some tips of the trade? Are there some tools? You know, can you have someone Sherpa you, you know, along this journey? Yeah, you absolutely can. And so one of the ways that I like to do that is just to share like some of the mindset shifts that I think have to occur in order for you to find sanity in this space. Because Andrea, I fully believe this is really controversial in some circles. I fully believe we have every right to feel sexy and vital and be whatever size we choose to be, like however comfortable we want to be or whatever shape we want to take. And I believe that all of that is our choice. If that's all our choice and it's all sort of entirely up to us and what we want. So first of all, you have to know what you want. So bottom line, I think it starts with mindset. You want me to give you some, some anecdotes? Yes, yes, please. (laughs) Okay. So the first sort of mindset shift that I had to embrace was there is no perfect diet. And when I say diet, I'm not even talking about capital D, you know, counter calories nonsense. I'm just talking about all of those, what we like to call eating lifestyles now, which is just sort of more syllables for diet. Is that the new word? (laughs) (laughs) I like that. Well, I don't know about you. I don't think you've been as much a victim as I have made myself in this, Andrea, but I have done it all. I have done it. You have. All. I've done keto. I've done vegan. I've done vegetarian. I've done paleo, which is hilarious because I don't like meat. So I was like a vegetarian paleo, which means I was like, I think I can have a fish and a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all. But make sure my fat's high enough. I've done it all. I've done low cal you know, super high carb. And I like to call that 1985 to 1995. That's what was all of us. Yeah. Right. Where I'm like, oh, I'll have a plain white potato and 85 snack well cookies. If there were a perfect diet or a perfect eating lifestyle, we would know by now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like we'd know by now. What happened for me is in trying to hack myself into a certain biology, trying to hack my body into a certain form by eating a certain way. That actually created a really big swing back for me in the form of binging. So that pendulum went way out and then came flying way back. And every time I would, sometimes it lasted a really long time, Andrea. Sometimes I was like, you know, eating in a certain eating lifestyle for three months at a time. But invariably that pendulum always swung back. And for me, again, that manifested itself in binge eating. And so there's a truism and that is that there are different eating lifestyles that work for people. I mean, people who have a lot of hormonal difficulty often do get better and feel better when they switch to a really high fat diet. That's Mm -hmm. factually correct. What I think we don't understand is that things work for us in seasons. And so if you think there's a perfect diet that you're going to land on that's going to be perfect for you from now until the end of time, then you're not being realistic with yourself and you're not giving yourself any room to evolve. And I think that's a really dangerous trap. So that's kind of the first thing I had to realize was something might be perfect for you for now. Mm hmm. And if we do not allow for seasons and for ups and downs and changes and shifts, then it can make us feel like we are broken. Hmm. Yes. I think that I'm curious about, I'm trying to think like, I wonder what the, you know, the listeners are thinking. And I, as you and I talk about getting to a point in our lives where we accept that, that things are seasons. And, and I, I wanted to speak on that for a little bit because I think that that can feel so far away for a lot of people. And I'm trying personally to like back up and think about like, what did I need to do in order to get to that place where I just Mm -hmm. was like, this is just how it is. And I think that I like that you were touching on, on beating yourself up. And I, I want to underscore that because I, See, the thing with shame is that it is effective in the, like you were saying, like in the short term, it can change someone's behavior on a dime. You know, like what I'm speaking to is like, if we shame someone else, parenting is a great (laughs) example of that. You know, you can shame a kid and they will change their behavior, you know, usually temporarily or sometimes permanently, but it has long lasting effects. Like Mm -hmm. this we know from research. And it's the same thing when we're shaming ourselves into looking a certain way being a certain weight, eating certain foods. And personally, I had to get to a place where I understood in my bones that that was not working for me. It was like an all out assault and violence against my soul. And that might sound a little dramatic, but that Mm -mm. is absolutely true. And how I felt it was that I first had to get to a place where I 
would, would not tolerate that that anymore at all with myself. I just will not tolerate it. And I want to say this too, like I have moments where I put on a pair of jeans and they are too tight and I'm like, mm, like I really like those jeans, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like I want them to fit. <laughs> and I might for a moment be like, ugh, you know, I wish I wouldn't have put this weight on or I just, I, it doesn't feel good to have the waistband of your pants too tight or not even be able to get them up over your hips and butt like that is a reality. And so I I don't want, I don't want people to to be listening, thinking like, oh, you know, like, oh, I need to get to that place where I just like celebrate my 25 pound weight gain. No, not necessarily, but it's just, I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of explaining it. Well, it's very hard. It's very, very difficult. And I stick my foot in it all the time because I came out of the closet and I told all my listeners, I was like, so I have a binge eating thing that I do and I'd I'd like to stop. And I, spoiler alert, I have, and there's a whole journey that I shared with everybody. But I was like, okay, so now I'm in this space where I don't want to talk about trying to, I don't want to imply anymore that we should all look a certain way because that's really what you're selling out there in the interwebs, right? Like if you have a picture of yourself on your podcast cover in little tiny white shorts, looking like a fitness guru, you are implicitly selling the idea that, you know, if you listen to what I say, you can look the way that I do. And so I demystified that. I pulled the plug on that. I was like, I don't look like that anymore. Uh (laughs) You were taking, yeah, I remember that picture that that you posted on Instagram when you were really bloated. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, look at this. (laughs) Like, this is what I look like today. And what's interesting, Andrea, is I have started to treat myself with just so much kinder, which is weird because like, I actually considered that weak. Yeah. So I considered that to be weak. And people who said, you need to love your body where it is. I was like, you know what? Go to hell because (laughs) I don't, (laughs) I don't stop telling me to love it. What I have learned is sort of multifaceted. One is I started with, I have a body, like instead of, I love it. This is amazing. Look at how that fat roll just rolls over those pants where it didn't used to. That's gorgeous. It's symbolic of Mm -hmm, of womanhood. No, no. I was like, okay, I have a body. Lucky me. Like that's literally where I had to start. Yeah. And then honestly, then I just stopped starting there. I literally just, I had to tune out. I just had to be like, I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to deal with it. And what's been so interesting is I just stopped putting so much energy into hating myself. And then I stopped putting so much energy into paying attention to my physical self, all while trying to figure out the food game and always exercising because I actually enjoy it. And a funny thing happened. I look completely normal. I look like myself. I don't think I'll ever look you know, like I did when I was 34 or 35, I don't think I will, but I've started to realize what a fiction that was. And that I've created this, like this identity that I'm trying to get to that doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, I've done all of the thought work there and been like, what am I doing to myself? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I said this before, but we are like, we are so give me a soapbox right now. We are so beautiful and we are so lucky. Like we are beautiful creatures and we are so lucky to have these bodies to move around in. And something that I like to say a lot is how is 86 year old you going to feel about you right now? She's going to be like, you're an idiot. You were so beautiful and sexy and like you had this body and like, I can't move like that anymore. And I sure don't look like that anymore. And 86 year old you is going to be like, you had no idea. And the way I can prove this to us right now is go pick up any photograph of you. I don't know, 10 years ago, five years ago, pick your time frame, And you're like, oh my gosh, I was so hard on myself then. And I looked wonderful and I was young and, you know, in youth is just so beautiful no matter what it looks like. And, and I like to give that perspective, Andrea, to have a zoom out to just be like, you know, what am I even doing spending this much time beating myself up? Mm -hmm. Speaking of wellness, we're interrupting this conversation. So I can tell you about one of our sponsors. We as a family started using HelloFresh because I had been wanting to have an easier way to make dinner that's not takeout or from the freezer section. Some things I wanted off my plate, pun intended, were planning dinners, spending money on takeout, or worrying about gathering ingredients week after week. It's a lot to have on your mind, right? HelloFresh took all that off my plate. Another thing I love about HelloFresh is that they allow you
you to choose your delivery day for when it works best for your schedule. And they offer a wide variety of chef curated recipes that change weekly. So you're not making the same thing over and over again. One of the recipes I made that was probably my favorite. I have a few favorites, but one that was probably my favorite was the hearty pork chili. And it was so damn good, y'all, that I was disappointed when I looked in the refrigerator the next morning and saw that my husband had taken the leftovers for lunch. Don't you hate it when that happens? It was so easy and convenient, so yummy. So if you're thinking about trying HelloFresh, please do so. Please support this wonderful sponsor that brings you this podcast. And you can get $30 off your first week. Just go to HelloFresh.com and enter YKAL30 as the promo code. I know I went on a little bit of a tear. <laughs> I think it's important. I think it's important for us to hear this as many times as we need to. I, you know, I always think that there's somebody listening who was like, I needed to hear this today. You have no idea how much. And it's it's true. It's, you know, my, one of my friends, Courtney, she says, she's like, I decided that I wanted to be a healthy, you know, in shape elderly person. And if I wanted to do that, then I need to be a healthy, in shape person now. And I was like, funny how that works. It's like retirement. Like if you want to have enough money for retirement, you don't just like retire and then decide like, I think I'm going to start saving money now. It's like not how it works. And I started thinking about that too, about my own health and fitness. But again, I still give myself permission to have a Twix bar for Halloween. And yeah. yeah. And I, so again, it's, it's about first, Uh, Just underlining this, like getting to that place of, I like that you say that, like I have a body, just accepting that you have it and noticing when you are beating yourself up to no end and trying to put the brakes on that. Plenty of resources out there about, you know, managing your inner critic. And so what else? Do you have any more tips about where someone can start? Yeah, because I think some people are like, okay, okay, okay. Like you're calling it out. This is true. But what do I do? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so a couple of things. First of all, one mindset shift that worked really, really well for me was I started focusing on my habits instead of the food I was putting in my mouth. And for some people that would also include like, what exercise am I doing? So for example, I talk to women all the time who are like, I'm a piece of crap because I didn't exercise today and I haven't worked out and I know I need to work out because look at my body mm-hmm. and, and they get in this shame loop between actually not exercising and then what they are eating. And I say to them like, who in, imagine that you're trying to sell the concept of exercise to somebody who's never heard of it before. And you're like, it's this thing you do because you eat terribly. And so then you have to go do this activity that you don't enjoy Nobody in order to, to compensate. <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> like, what is that? What if instead of focusing on how we eat the food we're putting in our mouths or what type of specific exercise we're doing, what if we focused on habits instead of diet? and exercise. And what I mean by that is, because it's a little bit of a semantics game, but what I mean is when you start looking at your habits, then you start looking at sort of the patterns that you're creating every day and why you're creating them. So I was like, oh, I have created a habit of binging. So a lot of people, I went in circles for a while where I was like, it must be my mother or Mm -hmm. it's stress or it's because I'm a business owner or a mom, you know, whatever. Like who can I blame? And also what caused this emotional state for me and blah, blah, blah. And then a funny thing happened, Andrea. I was like, wait, I'm actually really happy Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I'm still binge eating. So that's weird. And what it made me realize is I had created a habit of binging. I had created a habit. That was my go-to for some people. It's alcohol for some people. It's sex or shopping or, you know, the usual. And for me, when I was able, for some reason, when I was able to understand that that was just a habit, like a rut in my brain that I had created, it was a well-worn path. And so it was the path I was going to jump on every time I had certain emotions or triggers or, you know, was bored. When I realized it was a habit instead of some deep, you know, fillet mm-hmm. my soul kind of, <laughs> you know, thing Trauma, I had to unravel. Yeah, yes. redemption. <laughs> yes. It made me think of it so differently and it gave me dominion over it. I mean, it honestly was almost instant when I really had the epiphany and it made me realize that if we can actually look at what story do we have that's driving our eating, that's driving our self-care, what habits have we built around that story? 
I was like, oh, wait, oh, this really is about me Mm -hmm. (laughs) and self-awareness. But anyway, the main theme here is really examining your habits and what story is driving that behavior. It de-emphasizes food. It it de-emphasizes, you know, the things we keep creating as shame pillars in our life, food, Mm -hmm. diet, exercise. So it helped me focus on kind of who I want to be. So who am I and who do I want to be? And this is what you just said, which is, it's like, wait, I want to feel amazing when I'm older. And the conversation that you were having, I want to feel amazing when I'm older. Who do I have to be right now? Like, who do I want to be? How do I want to feel right now? And I'm sorry, I know I'm going on, but this is actually my eating philosophy now. And I think that some people might be interested in that because it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what do you do? And the what do I do for me is I actually make a point to consciously eat for how I want to feel right now. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to hack my body into what it should look like later, I am eating for how I want to feel right now. And that will give me the happy outcome of being who I want to be later. But that means that I'm conscious instead of unconscious and I'm not shame based about what I'm eating. Like I might eat that cake because I'm in the moment. I'm like, do I want to eat this red velvet cake in this environment with these amazing people and and enjoy that and not hate myself for it later? Yes. Do I want a third glass of wine right now because everybody else is? No. I mean, does that make sense, Mm -hmm. Andrea? Yeah, totally. And also what I started doing too is noticed if I'm eating something, and this is part of the habit thing, like eating something just because it's there or, you know, like the mindless eating, this is going to sound so dumb, but like ask myself, am I really enjoying this right now? Yes. That's not dumb at all. Like sometimes like I'll be at a kid's birthday party or something and like I'll say like yes to the cake and then I'm eating a bite of it and I just, it's not that good of a cake, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want this. I would much rather go to Maxi B's in Greensboro that has like the bet, like $50 cakes, like, and yes. you know why it's, it's, oh my God, like, I, like I'd rather eat a big piece of cake, like <laughs> once every two months like that, than have birthday cake. That's really not that good. Because savor, like savor should become a value. You know, vitality should become a value rather than my skinny jeans or, you know, that has sugar in it. So I can't have, I mean, I'm trying to attach myself to feelings that I want to create. Does that make sense? So, so savor is a verb, (laughs) (laughs) but it's a verb I want to experience. So, so this is funny because, you know, we have the Halloween garbage in the house and, and, and that sort of thing, but there's no mystery or like, it's not tantalizing me in any way because I'm like, dude, if I'm going down, I'm going down with really good, expensive, dark chocolate, which I will go buy and I will go eat, but I'm not going to, to just stuff the kids gross fake chocolate because it's, because I'm not supposed to, which is really mm-hmm. why we stuff that stuff. I mean, savor, enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, I, and I love that there are steps that we're talking about too. So we talked about just the whole, just accepting where you are, realizing, you know, listening for that inner critic. You've said that, you know, there's no perfect way to do it. No perfect diet and look at habits instead of like what you're actually eating. So what else do you have any more? Well, a couple of things I would love to get on the table before our time wraps up. And that is one sort of tough love message. And that is to tell yourself the truth. And I just think this is so important. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So tell yourself the truth about what season you are in right now. So I don't know if you know who Jenna Elfman is. She's Mm -hmm. like a Dharma and Greg, right? And then she was on some ABC show recently as well. Jenna Elfman, I just love her. And I had her on the show and she said, you know, I look at my life as a mixing board, you know, with the dials you push up and push down. And she said, I just know that sometimes like the bass is going to be really high and the treble is going to be really low. And the bass might be my kids and the the treble might be my marriage in that scenario. And, And then work might be dialed up. And I know I have to dial the family and the husband down a little bit. And she said, I just know that it goes up and it goes down. And as long as I don't leave one section too high and the other too low for too long, then it's going to be okay. Because at the end of the day, the net result is this beautiful mixture. And I was like, okay, I need to adopt that philosophy 
in the way that I treat myself, the way that I look at my food, the way that I look at my exercise. And if I'm just killing it and trying to launch a new business and then sell it, by the way, happy ending, I sold it. Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) Then I need to recognize what season I'm in and what my priorities are. Now, you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the exact same time. So Mm -hmm. could we please give ourselves a break? Like instead of saying, I should go to the gym, I really should go to the gym. Like, first of all, Ugh. Like who wants to do that when it's punishment and it's something that you should do and it's a chore? Why don't you just say, I'm not going to the gym. Like <laughs> it's not yeah. something I'm doing today. So this week is not a week that I'm focusing on killing it at CrossFit. Like it's not happening. And I think there's so much power in taking ownership back. Am I making sense? Totally. Yeah. It's always so amazing to me when I've, I've seen this with celebrities and non-celebrities is, is they have a pretty I don't know if it's strict, but a regimented workout program and they hate it. They hate (laughs) exercising. You know, they have a trainer and they complain about it. And, and I'm like, why? There's so many different ways to move your body. I just, God, I mean, like who doesn't love like ecstatic dance every once in a while? I just (laughs) in the kitchen. Right. you. It's like you knew that I was dying to tell you (laughs) that I also think – I think it's important to tell yourself the truth about three things. And the second one is tell yourself the truth about what you enjoy. I cannot – and you were just – this is exactly what you're saying. And Andrea, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to where they're like, yeah, well, I have to – you know, I don't like going to the gym. And I'm like, don't – Go go. to the Mm -hmm. gym. Do you realize that our parents were the first generation that even had a gym to go to? (laughs) Like (laughs) this didn't exist for roughly, I don't know, how long have we been around? Let's say millions of years. But to be just to keep it realistic, let's say a couple millennia of civilized humans not going to the gym and remaining perfectly healthy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like you go for a walk, dance in your kitchen, go do something that lights you up. I bought rollerblades, which actually turns out doesn't light me up. And yeah, bring in the nineties back. <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea. But have we, that's the third is tell yourself the truth about how you want to feel. When you start telling yourself the truth about how you want to feel, it helps you identify what you actually enjoy. And then it helps you identify then what are your actual priorities and what is important to you in this season? And I mean, when we realize that we are comparing ourselves to some false ideal that we're looking at in social media because we haven't cleansed and purged yet or. (laughs) And then the what is that like waste training thing? Have you seen that? No, and I don't even want to know. Like, I don't. I have an addictive person. One of the Kardashians. (laughs) Like on accident, I, I think I do. I have a Pavlovian <laughs> response to ways people hack themselves into like physical perfection. I'm like, what? What is it? I mean, I know that I shouldn't do it, but if you could just tell me what it is, I'd like to try it and then prove to myself that I shouldn't do it. Oh my God. Then yes. <laughs> healing. I'm healing. I'm in recovery. I'm in recovery. I think, and this is what I suppose I would leave people with. When we start telling ourselves the truth about how we want to feel, we might say to ourselves, you know, I actually just want to feel really good in my own body, like Mm -hmm. not her body, my body and not 21 year old body, but my body right now. I want to feel good. I like the word vitality because vitality is achievable. It's not, you know, size zero. It's I want to feel I want to embrace vitality. I want to feel sexy. I want to feel confident. Okay. Great. Identify your feelings and your adjectives that make sense to you. So then what do you enjoy? Like what actually lights you up? What movement and what food feels good in your body? Like, could we just spend a moment asking ourselves those questions? And then that lends itself to the third one that I mentioned, which is like, okay, so what's important to me? Mm -hmm. And then start where you are. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yes. And I want to say one more thing that's indirectly related and it just kind of popped into my mind, and I think it's an important anecdote. And it's it's really interesting to me, like now that this whole you know health at every size movement has come, the whole body positivity, which I know can be confusing for some, but it it, it is possible to be a size that our society has deemed overweight or unacceptable or unsexy or whatever. It is possible to feel good in that size, and oh yeah, it's you know we've been socialized. You know, newsflash, in case anybody doesn't know, we've been socialized to believe that there is only one beautiful way. And a huge epiphany I had, this happened not that long ago. So I got out of the shower one day and I looked in the mirror and, you know, this is like, you know, as my weight started to creep up and I 
was like, oh my God, that is my mother's body. Mm. And how I grew up is that my, I think that this might be like kind of an anomaly, but my mom never bashed her own body. She didn't ever say mean things about her body. We didn't have a scale growing up that I can remember. She just, it just was a non-issue. And I remember being a little girl and thinking that, yeah, she was, she was a little bit softer and rounder than, you know, cause I grew up in the eighties where it was like the Jane Fonda explosion mm-hmm. of fitness. And so I was already, it had already started when I was very young. I'd written in my Hello Kitty diary when I was 11 <laughs> that I thought I was fat. So it was already started, but I remember mm-hmm. my mom just, I thought she was beautiful. I absolutely thought she was beautiful. And so it was, it was such a poignant moment for me to see this person in the mirror. And my daughter has the exact same body structure that I do. So Mm -hmm. I know she's going to end up with the same body as I do. And for me, it was, it was such a huge moment of, of saying like, you know, if my mom can accept her own body and I look just like her and I accepted her body and my daughter's going to end up looking like the both of us, like, why would I not accept this as the way I am? And it just, it just is, it just fucking is. I have a body. Lucky me. (laughs) Look at me. There it is. There's my mother's body. I'll probably record a podcast episode just about that because it was such a huge moment of just Mm -hmm. like, oh, look at that. There it is. (laughs) Here's the secret truth. What is really sexy? Like when you really think about what is sexy, like meaning what defines sexy, it's never ever a size. It is confidence. Like it's a lot of things. It's light. It's what you exude. It's the energy. But, but if we're just being overly simplistic, it's confidence. It's Mm -hmm. how you show up in the world. And so, okay. So my options are binary. I can beat the hell out of myself because I don't look a certain way based on a fictional creature that exists in my mind only that nobody else even cares about, but me and create a permanent state of misery and shame. That sounds Mm -hmm. awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Or I can start where I am right now. And maybe I want to be leaner. And it's interesting because I'm now I enjoy sport. And so I look like I enjoy sport, right? Like that's just the body type that I have now is one that you get when you enjoy sport. Great. I also enjoy wine and chocolate chip cookies. Let's embrace it all. Uh (laughs) But my point is this, I can still, I understand that I had to embrace like just showing up in the world in whatever body I was given. And only then was I able to sort myself out and get back to myself. And if that's tricky, let me just red flag that because I am not selling an outcome. I am not saying, you know, if you just embrace yourself where you are, you will be a size X. Like, oh, I hate that message too, where you're like body positivity will lead you to the size you want to be. Like that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother day, Andrea. Mm -hmm. I just mean that sexiness and confidence and showing up in the world and feeling good in your body has absolutely nothing to do with the pair of jeans that you're wearing. Yes. Yes, sister. Preach. (laughs) It's so much easier to recognize that in other people. You recognized it in your daughter and in your mom, and that allowed you to see it in you. I would just invite everyone listening to just look around today and just look at the beauty that is around you and all these beautiful creatures and how they show up in the world and how none of them look the same. None of them look the same. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to yourself? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we could, I mean, this could be a 12 hour conversation and then we would need to break out those chocolate chip cookies that you mentioned, but, and and salad, but not from (laughs) store-bought. It's just a dressing, Andrea. My God, it was like petroleum. I don't know. (laughs) It's you good. could have used Full it for moisturizer. <laughs> Full of sugar is what it is. I know. Well, thank you so much. I am so glad that I got to have... I, it's been too long, 179 episodes, and I finally have you on. And I'm just grateful for this conversation. And you guys, go listen to On Air with Ella podcast. You will enjoy it. Her guests are awesome and insightful and you can join the journey over there and we will link up to that in the show notes as well as Ella's website and any other things that she wants to link us up to when are you writing a book are you going to write a book 
Oh, we are not talking about that. (laughs) You guys, I really want to thank you for sharing this space and time with me. I, I really know, I know Andrea is very protective of her audience and your time is super valuable. I just appreciate you guys sharing that with me. It's just, it's an important conversation. And I think like we were saying in the beginning, it's so overwhelming and we're so bombarded with that we're doing it wrong. And I think it's important to just tell the truth, like you were saying, and that it's all, it's all a journey. And that's really kind of what I preach over here all the time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you and to my listeners. Thank you for being here for another episode. And we will be back at you next week with a whole another episode. Please buy my book. Of course, I have to say that because I need you to buy it. And until next time, I'll see you out (laughs) in cyberspace. Bye-bye. We do because it feels to the listener, I think, like they're not in on the joke. I don't know. Do we have any jokes? I'll be, (laughs) I'll try to be a professional, but there are no promises. There are no promises. (laughs) That's not possible. Hey, do you edit? Like if I fart or something? (laughs) Only if you like put your ass by the microphone and do it. (laughs) Good to know. Good to know. I'll, I'll put it back on the shelf. Okay. Hey, ass kickers, you know what would help me out so much if you left a rating and review for this podcast. Your Kick-Ass Life podcast will always be free to you and to help me get more awesome guests and to spread the word, it helps tremendously if you leave a rating and a review. Now, they don't particularly make this super easy to do, so I'll help you out a little. If you're in iTunes and you're on your phone, when you are in the podcast app, you need to search for Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. I know, even if you're subscribed, this is how you do it. So when you search for it and you see it come up, click on the cover art, then towards the top where it says reviews, click that, scroll down a tiny little bit, and then click write a review. Stitcher is a bit easier if you're on Android. The easiest way I found to do this is to type into Google stitcher.com, your kick-ass life, and voila, my podcast should pop up as the first link. Scroll down and click write a review. That's it. Thank you so very much. You have no idea how much it helps me when you do that. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.